Welcome to Design to Move, a weekly functional movement series reviewing common movement impairment syndromes, muscle imbalances, and injury cycles, and how to correct for them. Don't just exercise, but restore optimal movement. Welcome back, guys, to another episode of Design to Move. My name is Ryan Maxwell. This is Ryan Parr. We're both movement specialists here with Fluid Health and Fitness. Today, we're going to address another postural distortion called forward head posture. It's colloquially called to or referred to as tech neck or scholar's neck. It has to do with the ascension of the head on the spine and rib cage. It has a lot to do with global postural issues that we're going to get into today. And it does uh, create quite a pain in the neck. <laughs> but the point is it has to do with, again, uneven posture around the hip line, how the body can go into more of a rounded posture through the spine. The cervical spine goes forward, the head kicks back, creates pain around the neck, creates all sorts of alterations in the sensory relationships. So we want to make sure that we correct for that, and we're going to do that today through all of our segments. If you have questions on today's topic, you can refer to our blog on the series down below, or you can reach out to us directly with questions at admin at fluidhealthandfitness.com. You can also see that we have a table of contents to the side here with segments stamped all the way down and a condensed version of the video at the bottom once you've gone through this video a couple times. So on that note, let's get started. This is our mobility and release segment for forward head posture. This time it's gonna focus on the hamstrings and scaling muscles. To lengthen the hamstring, we're gonna to need to make sure that we open up through our knee and our hips. Now, the hamstring is basically a knee flexor, but it's also a hip extensor and functionally, it helps to keep the pelvis rotated downward, okay? So the problem is if we're in a seated position a lot, we keep our knee in flexion, that muscle can become pretty tight over time, and then it can start to pull the pelvis under and distort the alignment of the spine that sits in that pelvis. So we'll see it as a bilateral, meaning both sides relationship, where both will tuck under, people start to lose the arch of the lumbar spine, right? Or we start to see it on one hemisphere, will it actually tuck under one side and create an obliquity in the way that the hips move. Both of which are gonna compromise the pelvis, the spine, and then the rib cage because of it. So how this factors up into the neck, we wanna make sure that you understand, and we can show them real quick. If the back's an extension and nice and long, it allows the spinal column to create less pressure on the base of the neck, and it allows him to create, again, a nice glide of the cranium so that the head fits nice on top of the C-spine, right, or the cervical spine. If the butt starts to round under because the hamstrings are taut, the ribs will rotate downward, creating what's called a kyphosis of the trunk. The spinal column will go forward with it, and the head will glide back to try to maintain its center of mass. So that, again, puts compression into these muscle groups, like your traps and your levators, your suboccipital muscles, all the muscles that give us tension headaches and pain around the shoulders and neck. Okay, so again, what we wanna do is recognize the importance of stabilizing our pelvis by reducing the pressure of the hamstrings. Now, in order to do that, you gotta make sure that the, the hamstrings don't pull the pelvis out of alignment. That's pretty key here. So Ryan's gonna show him how to do it. We're gonna do it on his left leg. So he's gonna extend his left leg in front. He's extended his knee, so the knee is straight. His toes are pointed up. That's gonna pull right from the ankle all the way up to the base of his hip where the hamstrings attach at the issue. Now he's gonna sit back into his hips, allowing the femur head to glide in the socket of the pelvis until he feels that first point of resistance or pull either behind his knee or under his hip. Now, if he goes too far, notice what's gonna to happen to his back. It starts to round. So he starts to lose the arch of his lower back. That happens to a lot of us. A lot of people think that they have more mobility than they do, and when in reality, they're just actually moving through the spinal column and not really stretching the muscle. So we wanna make sure that again, we keep the back extended. He's gonna breathe out as he sinks his hips back. And as he does that, he's gonna glide or pull his opposite hip, his right hip up into flexion. That's gonna to help to reduce the pressure on the other hamstring. And then when he gets to the first point of resistance where there's no pain, the muscle's not quaking, he's gonna then bend his left knee, flex his heel into the ground in traction, flex it to prematurely flex the muscle, Hold that for about three to six seconds, and then relax, and then again, go back into back extension, straighten the knee, and sink a little bit lower. What you'll notice is if you apply this neuromuscular stretch, it'll help to reduce the tone of the muscle, get the muscle to relax, and you'll naturally be able to get more length out of it without pulling on it too hard, which again could lead to more trauma in the muscle, 
and make it actually more stiff over the long term. So Ryan would do that through a sequence of about six to 10 segments or breathing cycles. And the goal again is to try to get the hip with no displacement in the pelvis to about 95 degrees of hip flexion, again, without any back rounding or hip turning under. You do both sides and then we would move into our scalings. Now again, we recognize the importance of how the body works globally. If the hips are tucked under, it's going to pull the spine and rib cage basically towards the center. It'll hollow out our spine, pull our pelvis in, and pull our ribs down. So it hollows us, it's haunching us. Now remember, the spine has two curves to it. We have a lordotic curve here at our lumbar and our cervical spine, and we have a cathodic curve. It means convex through the ribs and through the sacrum down here as it fits into the pelvis. Now, if my hips become rounded under, it starts to lose the lower dotted curvatures of our lumbar and cervical spine, pulling everything forward into extension, and the head will click or come back. Now, when that goes on, the ribs come down, and the muscles that attach the ribs to the neck become either taut and pulled down, called the scalenes, which are responsible for side-to-side -side flexion, again, flexion of the neck, and again, rotation partially, they become over-engaged. Now that again can pull the spine forward, ascend it, and the head then will glide back against that pressure as the externals back here, or extensors, fight back against that tension. That creates a whole mess of trouble for the head on the spine. So what we're gonna do is identify where those scalenes are. So if I go like this, you can kind of see them. If I tilt my head, Ryan can see it. And if you push over, you can see them kind of bundle up here. They're little stringy like muscles. Now again, they attach the ribs, your two, your rib two and three, up to your cervical spine. See, two, three, and four, okay? So all the way up to the top almost of your neck. And again, that has to do with the suspension of your neck, like a tent line holding it up back and forth, okay? So what we don't want is all this pressure pulling our spine forward and kicking our head back. So what we would do is use our fingertips. You can trace the muscle, the bigger of these muscles called the sternocleidomastoid, trace it down to the collarbone, and then go laterally offside to the front. And if you run your fingers there, you should feel, again, some stringy-like muscles, mm -hmm. okay? Now, if I push into it gently and laterally tilt my head, I can feel it run all the way up into the front of my spine there on the seat. You feel that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if I want to stretch them, I'm going to step forward, and I'm going to use my right fingers on my left scalenes. I'm going to step forward on my left leg. I'm going to step back on my right. I'm going to pull my arm back and around, rotating it around my ribs. I'm going to tip my head gently to the opposite direction, turn my head to the opposite direction, and look down, and then look up, and then relax and then push it a little bit deeper. It should be passive, again, softer the next go through. So I'm gonna breathe out, tuck my chin, tilt my head to the opposite side, rotate my arm, rotate my head to the opposite side, look down, look up, and then relax, okay? The act of looking up and looking down is gonna change the orientation of the stretch. Looking up, we'll start to stretch through the anterior and medial scalene. There's three of them. Looking down, we'll start to stretch through the posterior. A lot of times on our non-dominant side, normally our left side, our posterior scalene and trap are tight. On the other side, the right side or dominant side, most of us are dominant on that right side, we're gonna feel it more on the anterior side, okay? Now once we're done, there should be no pain, no tingling. It should be nice and soft. You should feel a lot more freedom of motion around your turning of your head, and again, the nodding up and down extension flexion, okay? Once we're done with that, we would do the same breathing pattern just like we did with the hamstring. We would approach this six to 10 times, breathe out, glide the arm down, hold the ribs down, tilt the head, look down, look up, breathe in, relax, push in again, and go through that cycle. Again, six to 10 sides, three times on the left side, and on the right, and then that would wrap us up for our segment on mobility, and then we would get into strengthening the good stuff. So let's get to it.
This is the activation portion of our video, and we're gonna be targeting a deep cervical flexor with our lower back extensor muscles doing a prone cobra on the ground. So Ryan's on the table and he's getting himself into a position to do what's called a prone cobra. Now, normally prone cobras, you see people do this where they draw their arms back behind their body, they're lifting it up off the table, bringing the arm into horizontal adduction and scapular retraction, okay, and depression, and then they'll kick their head up and go into, again, hyperextension through the neck too. Now, that is all not what we wanna do, okay? So the point here is that the body is trying to maintain symmetries of tension on both the front and the back sides. Oftentimes, due to our natural posture, some of us have hyperextension in our lower backs, while other of us have hyperflexion in our lower backs, again, having to do with the musculature of the hips and the inadequacy of the core to stabilize the pelvis. So what we wanna do is first understand that this isn't for everybody, okay? If you do have hyperextension in your lower back, you really don't wanna reinforce that by making these muscles stronger. So what we're really hoping to accomplish today is maintain the neutral alignment of your lumbar spine by keeping its natural arch. What that really means is we want a nice subtle depression inward on the lumbar portion, which is about 25 degrees. So what I'm gonna do in order to maintain that is engage my abdominals before I lift my back into extension. So what Ryan's gonna do is breathe all the air out of his lung that's gonna bring the ribs down. They're gonna descend by engaging his abdominals. He's gonna keep those abdominals nice and controlled and tight. And then he's gonna lift up, bringing his body weight up off the ground from his torso. Now as he lifts, you'll notice that he's not going into hyperextension and he doesn't have a huge amount of lift with his chest wall off the table. Then he's gonna come down. So that's the premature or the first element that we wanna focus on. Second element is the retraction of the scapula, getting them back down towards the spine, holding the shoulder girdle back as the arm rotates externally in that socket of the scapula. So again, he's controlled his lumbar spine, he's lifting the torso off the ground, and he's gliding the scapula back around the ribs. At the same time, he's keeping his chin from arching up or looking up. He's keeping his head depressed and chin depressed with his skull almost gliding backwards like he's trying to place, again, a string on the crown of his head, pulling his head upright like so. So it's not looking down, because again, that would be overusing our scalenes, he's gliding back. And when he does that, there should be a marked reduction in pressure along the back of the neck, where the muscles attach into the base of the skull, the suboccipitals, the levators, and the trapezius. So he's using his mid-lower traps, his rhomboids, his erectors, and his deep cervical flexors that hold his spine in a neutral position, keeping the natural lower dotted curvature of his cervical spine, all the while keeping the head placement right over top of that column. Good job, bro. Now again, that's a lot to think about as you're doing this, but generally speaking, you wanna think about pulling your tongue back into your mouth, keeping your chin tucked down, almost down towards your sternum, but not, not deeply, and you want to try to keep your head and body weight posture backward over your rib cage. As you do that, you'll notice that you'll get a better engagement of these lower mid-back muscles between the scapula, rather than the upper traps, which are gonna to wanna to make your shoulders shrug. If at any time you start to notice that your hamstrings are kicking in, that you're overarching through the lower back, or that your shoulders start to shrug, or your neck starts to kick up like so, you're gonna to wanna to reduce the range of motion and focus on making the movement smaller and more controlled. You're gonna go through two sets of 20 repetitions with 60 seconds of recovery in between each one, and you wanna make sure that you make it a nice, strong, decisive contraction, and then gently come down and let the body come down against gravity for a nice slow count of about two to three seconds. So once you're done with both sets, that'll finish up the segment on activation, and then we can get into integration. This is our integration segment of the video. This is where we teach you how to use the right sets of muscles in the right firing pattern to create clean, efficient, full body movement like you would see in everyday life. And we're gonna do that by doing a single leg deadlift with a dumbbell scaption or rotation on the same hemisphere. 
So now we're going to integrate this into what it would look like in full body movement. So when a person walks, they're going to go cross body action and reciprocation. So when I step into my left leg, and Ryan can show us here, when he steps into his left leg, his left arm is going to go behind him. So when the lower quarter of his body, his lower left leg goes in front into flexion, his upper body on the, up, the same hemisphere is going to go back into extension. So the pelvis needs to be stable and the scapula needs to be stable on a somewhat dynamically stable spine and rib cage. So what Ryan's gonna do is first stabilize his left foot, he's gonna keep his foot from jumping in. He's gonna start to hinge through his knee and pelvis, sitting backwards into his hip, maintaining a nice neutral alignment so he's not paunching again, creating that extra rounding of the spine. And he's gonna keep, again, his head placement in line with his trunk. So the edge of his head here, his cranium or skull, should be in line with his TL junction where his ribs meet up with his lumbar and his sacrum down here. His chin's not gonna to be too outreached, extended, and he's not gonna to extend too deep, and he's not gonna flex down too hard, and again, round his neck. It's gonna be neutral, so his head's gonna be tucked down, his line of sight should be in line with what would be a neutral spinal alignment there. Now, at the top of that movement, he's gonna pull his arm around into retraction using a five pound dumbbell, and then he's going to breathe in, come up into hip extension, and try to balance at the top. Now, once again, he's gonna to try to stack his weight so that his head is in line with his trunk. His trunk is over his hips, and his hips are nice and stable and parallel to the floor, perpendicular to the femur, because he's engaging his abdominals on the opposite hemisphere and his glute and stabilizers on his left hemisphere. So let's do it again, Ryan. Again, foot stable, knees bending, bringing the knee to the tip of the toe as much as you can to get the stretch from the hamstring, making sure we maintain a nice neutral arch in the spine, scapula is stable, external rotation of the humerus so the thumb rotates behind you, Head is in line with the torso, gaze is fixed, and breathe out and come back up to the top. So awesome example, Ryan. Hopefully you guys at home are doing the same thing. If you notice that you start to break down in your lines of motion, if your ankle starts to roll in or the knee starts to drop, or you start to see a hike or hip pivot out, so either a varus or valgus, varus out, valgus in of the hip, or you start to see the back round or excessively arch or again, excessive board lean, or again, you see the shoulder shrug, or elevate, or shrug up and back, or the neck kicks up. All of these are indicators that this might be beyond your comfort zone and capacity to maintain clean and efficient movement. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is reduce the weight or the range of motion around the axis of rotation in each one of these joints. Now, if you do it properly, you can try to shoot for two sets of 20 repetitions. Once again, there's a nice slow controlled descent into the flexion of the hip with the neutral spine, and then coming back up for one. Okay, so we wanna control gravity the entire time to make sure that we protect our joint centers by maintaining isometric contractions. So once we've gotten through two, we're gonna finish it off with our flexion of our neck, and that brings us to strength, so let's go into it. And we're gonna finish up with our strength segment where we're gonna be targeting really deficient, weaker muscle groups and help them to get overloaded so we can change their natural passive tone to help maintain the joint centers and axis of rotation around your major, major joints. And again, we're gonna be doing that with a prone four-point cervical flexion. Ryan's in a four-point position on the table here. You can do it from the ground. He's got his arms directly underneath of his shoulders and he's got his legs underneath of his hips bent at 90. One more time, we're trying to maintain a neutral spinal alignment which means we don't want the back to arch too much and sink down towards the table. And we don't want to round too much like this, so doming like so. Now, if you have tight hamstrings, you may notice that your hips like to round under like so, or if you have tight hip flexors, you might notice that the back starts to arch down more than it should. So you're trying to keep it somewhat neutral. And by neutral, we mean that the sacrum, the, where the ribs meet up with the lumbar and the base of your skull we're all on one plane. Now that's where we would set up from. Now again, we know that if our body is in an excessively haunched position because of poor posture, the spine rounds, the cervical spine goes forward into too much flexion, and the head is going to kick back into again, an excess glide, or again, you're gonna look up. 
So what we want to do is try to set everything up neutral through the lumbar, thoracic, and cervical by pulling that neck deep into its position by engaging what's called your deep cervical flexors, the choline capitis. These are muscles that attach directly to the anterior portion of your cervical spine, and it helps to balance out and stabilize your neck. So we're gonna keep those deep cervical flexors engaged. He's gonna let his head drop down and go into flexion, and then he's gonna draw it back up, go into neck extension, and again, cranial glide, so that as he comes back, he's tucking his chin, giving himself a little bit of a double chin, almost like he's pulling his tongue back in his, his mouth and breathing in at the same time. Now we can use his eyes to help with this, so as he pulls back and up, he can look down a little bit as he pulls the head up. And when you do that, it's almost like a book is coming back on a shelf and there's a string right at the tip pulling his head upright. It's gonna unload the pressure on his neck. This feels really good if you do it right. And again, it's gonna help to reduce all the pressure of these levator muscles and upper trapezius muscles that pull our neck back or our head back into posterior glide stretching and pulling more into these scalenes that are again being tugged upon because they're trying to support the ribs. So all of this is going to help to reduce all that pressure around the neck and the head. So again, Ryan's going to let his head glide forward. He's going to let it fall, 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 just slightly lower than right at that TL. And then he's going to pull his head back, tuck his chin, glide it up. And you'll notice again that there's not an excessive amount of tone right there at the base of the neck. Good job, Ryan. So, try your best to keep that position. It may be hard for some of you. A lot of times we've created some really bad posture habits. So a lot of times people, when they're doing it, they do this. So instead of pulling the spine back into lordosis and then gliding the head on top of your C1 spine, right, atlanto-occipital joint, they try to use their flexors to compensate and they do this. So the shoulders will shrug up because of the excess pressure from the extensors. The shoulders will roll in and their head will tuck down. It's not a flexion down, it's a glide back. Okay, now again, pulling the tongue into the mouth, looking down with the eyes, breathing in, all should help with that response. Again, we're gonna shoot for two sets of 20 repetitions, a nice slow controlled descent, and a pretty meaningful and decisive flexion back. Okay, and you would give yourself 60 seconds between the sets. And that would bring us to the end of our strength segment. So that wraps up our segment on forward head posture. Remember, the posture of the head or the placement of the head is all relative to the spinal column. The spinal column is all, again, relative to the pelvic alignment. So if our hips are off-centered, whether they're pulled downward or under more than they should, it's gonna impact the curvature of your spine and by extension, the placement of your ribs and skull. It's very important that we address both issues, the pelvis, the spine and ribs, and the placement of the skull. We did that today by releasing the hamstrings and scalenes, just one of the issues that you might see in your posture, along with activating common deficient muscle groups like the extensors of the lumbar spine and the deep cervical flexors of the cervical spine. Once again, if you have questions on any of the information that we went over today, make sure to reach out to us at admin at foodhealthfitness.com. We do welcome you to read our blog on the topic so you can get more information. And as always, your body's designed to move, so stay in motion. We'll see you next time for another episode.